Hey! Uh, I don't know if I need the light on. At least this time I do not have my mic uh, muted. Uh, so, welcome to the Square Circle Podcast. I am Marie Shadows. I'm the host and the creator of the Square Circle Podcast. And we are live on Twitch and YouTube. I no longer want to go live on Twitter just because it does kind of help, I guess, get my name out there and people can like, you know, uh, watch it as they're scrolling through Twitter and stuff like that. And then like, you know, they they like what I have to say. They'll follow me on Twitter, which is great. But in the end, no one, it doesn't really like help help. Uh, like I can't really get the analytics from uh, Twitter. I could only see like how many people viewed it um, and stuff like that. But the actual analytics that I rely on in order to grow uh, my live stream and the channel doesn't really help me with uh, the Twitter side. Um, so stuff like the analytics from Twitch and YouTube, those help me. Um, I do not have a degree in like analytics to really understand everything, but I understand the basics of like how to get, um, you know, more this, more that, uh, different viewers and stuff. Uh, so yeah. Why? Okay. I don't know. I just got a message request from somebody. Uh, So I'll check out that message request um, from somebody, but you know, if it's a weird name and then numbers, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, but yeah, the reason why I don't want to use Twitter is only because it doesn't give me the analytics and then... I don't know if people on Twitter saw it and if they saw it, they don't give me feedback or anything like that. So yeah, um, I can see where it can be a good thing. And also I can see where it really can't be a good thing. And it's just there, um, just to be there. Uh, <laughs> AJ Rob, what's up? Yeah, man. Uh, we're still going to be talking about Jay. Um, and breaking stuff down some more, um, you know, just because, uh, there's a lot more stuff to unpack. Uh, there's a lot more stuff that happened on the Twitter timeline today on Sunday. And, um, you know, I think in wrestling, um, if it's not Bullet Club creating story, it's WWE creating story with Roman, which I know might be a shocker to like most of you guys, uh, hearing me say that. But it's actually, you know, um, sort of true. If it's not Bullet Club and New Japan Pro Wrestling creating some type of, like, hot-ass story, it's WWE doing that with Roman. Because um, I really can't tell you, like, the hottest story in AEW. Um, if you guys can tell me the hottest story in AEW, you know, uh, put it down in chat. Um, you know, I just don't think there is a hot story in AEW. Um, you know, Hangman doesn't really have a hot story other than like he's putting on 60 minute matches, really long matches, hardcore matches. And these are like big moments. And there's no, I mean, there's breathing room like in between them, but the buildups are kind of like sucky in a way. So like if he's trying to be this champion of that, he, he goes zero to a hundred in these big matches why? Those big matches should mean something, especially if you have like a buildup that's meant to lead to these big matches. Um, and then also he gets like put into the shadow, depending on who, like who he's feuding with. Like, I know that when he feud with, uh, Danielson, that like the spotlight was on Danielson. Danielson has a bigger star power than, uh, Hangman. Don't try to debate me on that because that's 100% true. Danielson has a bigger star power than Hangman. Uh, so, you know, that's why that one was just like lackluster. But then when it came to uh, the match, Danielson like was having Hangman work it, you know, to make it uh, really good. And then we get that. We get like two matches of that, uh, two really big matches. Um, and there's no like 
in between type of thing. Um, and then after that, we got uh, him versus Archer. Archer is racking up wins on Dark and Dark Elevation against, unfortunately, nobodies, even though they're on the indies and trying to make a name for themselves. But when you do not have a video package for them to introduce them to us so that we know who they are, because everyone around the world is not going to be going to the local indies of where they wrestle at in their hometown to be like, oh my God, I saw that guy on AEW and stuff like that. They're not going to do that. So you you really do have to like hold a fan's hand and can't expect the casual fan who's like, you know, on YouTube and maybe after the YouTube video is finished, um, AEW gets suggested to them and they're like, oh, I haven't watched wrestling in years. Um, you know, all they know is uh, probably like, you know, WWE, but then when they watch AEW, they're like, who are these guys? If you're not giving the indie... Um, wrestlers that come onto the show, um, you know, some type of video package, some type of thing that says, hi, I'm so-and-so or whatever it is. Um, then basically, you know, you're, you're not doing it right. You're not giving them the time of day. They're giving you Tony Khan, their time and their effort and their hard work to be featured on AEW Dark so that way they can, like, you know, get a leg up. However, um, you know, if you're not going to provide them the same sort of respect back and forth by just doing a quick little video package or letting them, like, do their own video package of, like, I, you know what? I shouldn't say video package. I should say promo. Uh, doing their own promo so that way when it's released, it's like, oh, you know, this is who they are. And they have that as a little snippet. So that way, a casual fan who doesn't go to their local indies can appreciate if they're tuning in on YouTube to be like, oh, okay, that's a uh, that's an indie wrestler. Um, that's that. But yeah, you know, uh, if Tony is going to uh, make AEW his way, and not listen to a constructive criticism like that, then, you know, um, I don't know if he's ever going to, like, listen to people. Um, you know, I wish he would listen to people. Um, I wish that he'll stop uh, revealing his hand whenever he's on Busted Open Radio and they're like, ooh, what big surprises you have? Or, like, you know, dirt sheets protecting him and AEW. And then when Kenny does almost like a tell-all type of thing, it's like... Um, you know, it's very eye opening, you know, um, which we all called it. We all called the really weird red flags. And then, you know, we're just like, this, this makes total sense for why it's like this. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, I just wish that, you know, um, things were a little bit more ordered and structured in AEW and, the only reason why I'm talking about AEW first is because I was saying that the hottest stories right now is Bullet Club. The hottest story right now, uh, aside from that, is whatever Roman Reigns is doing in WWE, along with Brock Lesnar and what and with uh, Lashley. So those are the biggest stories where I can dive into it and give you guys a different perspective and even help any of the casual fans that are uh, going through Twitch and YouTube and hearing this can understand like, you know, what's happening a little bit more. Um, if you are not like too into this at all. Um, so yeah. Um, again, if you can tell me what's the biggest story, uh, in AEW, um, I would love, 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 love to hear it. Uh, speaking of AEW, right, um, I, I'm probably going to jump all around here. Uh, I should go from like company to company to company, but I was just thinking about this. Um, that, uh, I was watching, um, uh, New Japan Strong. 
because we're going to get to New Japan Strong, and this was the one that happened yesterday. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure if it's going to be spoilers or whatever, but spoiler alert right here, right now. Um, Jay White is doing his open uh, challenge on New Japan Strong. He's doing uh, the US of J Tour, and the one wrestler that showed up this week is Jay Lethal. Um, so basically, oh shit, <laughs> J-Rod is going to be live on, uh, well, at, at AEW on Wednesday. He's not going to be like, he's going to attend the show. Uh, but that got me super excited. Um, yeah. So congrats to, uh, J-Rod for picking up tickets, uh, and going to an AEW show. Um, uh, I really wish you, uh, having a fun time. Um, Newark with the, uh, the Prudential Center, they fucking suck. They suck. They have outdated policies and it was fucking horrible. It was a horrible experience. Uh, so all the video that I took to do a little like vlog about it that day. Yeah, it's, it's in my folder. It fucking sucks. The only thing that like made it, uh, cool was getting to experience, uh, Minoru Suzuki's um, theme and singing along with everybody. And, you know, um, the fans over there go to have a good time. The other good time that I had was just randomly talking to this dude um, about the place and about beer. And this chick had like chimed in and she was wondering if she had like skipped us or whatever um, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I had a very good talk with like a random guy and a random chick. Um, but yeah, the Prudential Center, you guys fucking suck. Like you need to, uh, update those fucking outdated policies. Like we're past 9-11. We're good. Um, 9-11 affected New York City more than, more than New Jersey. Um, you know, New Jersey is still the armpit of New York City. So, yeah, you guys are fine. Like, everyone hates New York City because we're loudmouths and, like, we talk our truth and everything like that. New Jersey, you guys are fine. Um, yeah, uh, j Ross says he'll be in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Hopefully the fans don't suck. I don't think the fans will suck, um, but, you know, Bridgeport, Connecticut is definitely uh, going to be, um, like... You know, it's, it's WWE territory. So expect, I, I can't really say expect the unexpected, but just expect things. Um, and yeah, the one in Arthur Ashe was really good. That's what I, that's what I heard. Um, and yeah, that one, yeah, I didn't really go to that one. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, like I was saying, speaking of, uh, AEW and, uh, Jay Letho, Jay Letho, uh, definitely, uh, Jay Lethal showed up, uh, to answer Jay White's, uh, invitation, um, for his open challenge. And I thought it was, uh, kind of interesting that they keep sending him AEW guys. Uh, they sent him Christopher Daniels, uh, then now they sent him Jay Lethal, um, and it was a really good match from start to finish. Um, you know, uh, they haven't fought since like Jay White was like a baby, not like a literal baby, but like, you know, super young in the business, uh, when, you know, Ring of Honor was still thriving and stuff. So yeah. Um, you know, the only reason why I bring it up is because I don't necessarily like the fact that, um, AEW wrestlers, are, uh, still, um, <laughs> yo, Switchblade GT, uh, I'll, I'll get to Jay White, I'll get to Jay White in a moment, man, I'll get to Jay White, I know, I, I know you and I are, like, you know, right here, you know, uh, where we're both Jay White fans, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get, I'll get to Jay White <laughs> in a moment, um, so, yeah, I just think that AEW should stop having, like, wrestlers uh, take other bookings. Because I need... I would like Jay Lito to be, like, in, you know, the AEW scene. Um, basically in, uh, you know, top contender for, like, the title and stuff. I don't mind him fighting Jay White. That's cool, too. But other than that, it's like, you know, 
stop messing around with like your black wrestlers. Like let them do what they got to do. I am happy that both Will Hobbs and like Keith Lee uh, made it to the uh, the face of the revolution match, which is still a gimmicky match, but at least they're there. Um, so I guess, I guess we should really talk about the hot topic, which is uh, Jay White. I'm trying to like, you know, do everything. So, uh, so Switchblade GT, I did a post live stream yesterday talking about this. Uh, Jay Lethal is signed to AEW, but he has the ability to book himself if he wants to like wrestle for another company. So, um, if, um, everything goes okay, um, he was able to wrestle Jay White on New Japan Strong. Um, he's able to take bookings. Like all of them are able to take bookings if they want to. Um, so yeah, um, that's what, um, that's what's happening. I'm just saying that I don't think it's, uh, necessary or it's good for certain wrestlers to take bookings, especially when they just got there. Um, and then for some reason, um, uh, for some reason, I think that, uh, Jay Letho being on dark doesn't help him either. You know? He came in hot. He challenged Sammy Guevara. Uh, he didn't get the championship title, so now he goes back to dark. Why is that the fucking pattern in AEW? Like, instead of Tony trying to be like, I got this big surprise. Guys, listen to me. I got this big surprise. Can you at least work on, like, your logic behind guys that are like, they come in hot, they were world champions in other promotions, and then when they come to AEW, they get the fucking booted treatment of challenging for a title, lose, and then end up a fucking dark and dark revelation and rampage and never see like dynamite ever fucking again until you kind of remember them and you're like, hey, I remember I had this wrestler. Like, Tony Khan, just get your shit together, man. Like, if you need someone to help you get your shit together, like, hire me. I can help you get your shit together. You don't have to like me or anything like that um, because I will probably just straight up but Marie Shadows is open for business and uh you guys can hire me so yeah um you know if you want me to get your shit together um that does not mean like getting you coffee and like other stuff like that but that just means you know tidying up the roster um yeah uh yeah that really is the pattern that I just um that yeah the that's the pattern uh, lately in my, in my live streams, I've been, uh, talking about the patterns of AEW. So another pattern is that, um, I'm going to say it again, is that, um, Tony Khan, right? So like, there's a difference, right? Between like myself, um, and then someone like Tony Khan, who's like born into money and doesn't really have to like struggle. And then there's someone like me and like the rest of some, and the rest of other people who are ordinary have to struggle and eventually get over their obstacles and, you know, make the best life for themselves. And so, you know, um, Tony really doesn't have though that like world experience that like I wouldn't have or someone else would have. So his constant personality trait is to make sure that he pleases people in order for people to like him, in order for people to be like, oh, I feel comfortable with him. So he's having a good time. You're having a good time. And the moment that you show any type of like disdain or any type of like resistance to something, um, you know, he's going to lose his shit because he doesn't know how to handle that. He doesn't know how to process that. Like someone like myself or anyone else who's been on the receiving end of like either being poor or being mistreated or never really had, um, the luxury to really like, um, feel good about something. Um, so, oh, and also like for someone to please them. Uh, so, you know, he has that personality trait of, he always has to please the person. Like he pleases all the fans, all the hardcore fans. And the moment that any criticism comes into that bubble, that's it. He, he loses his shit. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to recover from that. What he does is that he keeps piling on these surprises and these surprises are going to keep you happy short term. And then you're going to keep asking for more and more and more. And then when we get to the day that he cannot deliver any more surprises to you, what are you going to do? You know, um, it's one of those other personality traits that like he has. And that's just because, you know, he was born into money. He never really had like 
uh, a really nine to five stressful job, like either working at McDonald's or working at Gap or anything that can relate to us. He's more of the, I got the money. Let me shower you with money. You know, let me make it rain and stuff like that. And, you know, let's make you happy, which is all fine. You know, we all want to be happy. We all want to have like a stress-free life. We want to be comfortable, but it gets to the point where it becomes too dangerous. And, you know, like I said, the moment that he cannot um, continue with his surprises, what are the fans going to do? Are the fans going to turn on him because he can't deliver on those surprises and then everybody is spoiled and then, you know, people will turn on AEW because they're not going to get what they want. You don't necessarily end up in a very good position when you become everyone's friends, especially in a business where it's like cutthroat and very uh, competition filled. But that doesn't mean that you're going to knock the other person down just to elevate yourself. Like the wrestling business should be all about elevating each other. However, if you are the businessman and you uh, own, um, you know, the company, you got to treat it like a business. You got to treat it like, you know, this could go under like any day. If you treat it like a, like a friend, um, we're going to have these problems. Um, you know, uh, Kenny Omega like had some really eye opening things to really say when, uh, he was on the wrestling observer and he was getting interviewed and, you know, when you really read it and analyze it and kind of think back to the three years that AEW has been around, you're like, oh shit, this is, this is real. Um, you know, I was once one of those fans that was going to be blindsided by like, this is so new. This is great. They're going to be an alternative. I still think they're an alternative, but the way that the track record has been going, I don't trust it. That's why I really don't trust, um, that Jay White is in AEW just because of how Tony Khan treats New Japan pro wrestlers, treats impact wrestlers. He fucking buried impact. I don't care what anyone says out there. AEW buried Impact for the longest and Impact took it like, you know, it was like, all right, we're just going to take this and when the storm settles, uh, we're going to rise from the ashes and that's what the fuck they're doing because guess what? We're talking about Impact. We're talking about New Japan Pro Wrestling. We're not even talking about AEW and their stories because they have no stories. They have micro stories, which is different, but they do not have very impactful, powerful stories where I can sit here and be like, let's break it down. Let me break down why Jay White did what he did. Let me break down why, you know, Tama like retaliated on Twitter the way he did and why the Young Bucks are getting into it and the whole entire history and story. Yes, this is long-term storytelling. Um, but, uh, you know, it's the thing of you have to do it right. And timing is everything. And that's what Tony Khan does not understand. He doesn't understand that timing is everything. He thinks that because people are not talking about him and people are not talking about AEW, his baby, that he has to give us what we want. Half of us are so blinded by like, oh my God, we get like these huge stars. Like, you know, it's kind of fucked up that, you know, we, we got Keith Lee. Uh, someone that could definitely thrive in AEW and, you know, be a big powerhouse and like add, excuse me, a lot to the plate. But to have Keith Lee and Jay White show up in the same day on the same show doing two different things, the name of Jay White kind of just pushed Keith Lee to the side. I, I'm going to say it. And that's very unfortunate because, you know, if Keith Lee, like, signed an actual AEW deal rather than, like, I'm guessing uh, Jay has, like, you know, he'll appear on AEW for these dates while he does New Japan Pro Wrestling, New Japan Strong, and, like, anything else. Um, which, by the way, like, you know, Tony could have got everybody in trouble. Like, this guy does not think through his legal shit because he only has one person working legal and like, you're not supposed to have just one person working legal. If you guys don't know, I did like a whole entire, um, podcast episode explaining about like the red flags that Tony Khan has. And that's just based off my knowledge of like, you know, um, you're not supposed to do certain things like in the business and shit like that. 
Like it could have like legal ramp uh, legal shit going about it um and whatnot. But yeah, like doing something like that where like Keith Lee comes in, he's supposed to be like like the biggest name, the biggest um surprise, and then you have Jay White, and because we know Jay White and we're like interested with Jay White, the Bullet Club, with Tama, with the uh the Young Bucks, uh the Good Brothers, we're like, oh shit, our attention is here. And it's not to the person who really signed an AEW contract and is an AEW star. You know, you, you get that? Um, it's just those little things, you know? And sometimes the AEW fans on Twitter can get fucking annoying because it's like, you guys want all this cool shit. I want cool shit too. But I want logical stuff too in my wrestling, man. Like, you know, you can't just throw shit at the wall and see if it sticks. Um, but yeah. Uh, let me just go back up here and, uh, read some, uh, some stuff. Uh, but first of all, I do have, um, you know, my, my Twitter open just in case if like, you know, Tama wants to start dropping, uh, some stuff over, um, you know, uh, over on Twitter, like he was doing, but the real chat is over on Twitch. Uh, so yeah, um, Switchblade uh, GT said, I won't be surprised if I see Keith Lee on Dark or Evelation. True, right? Like, I, you know, true. Uh, j Rod tells me that's actually true. Uh, Switchblade is all like, uh, these wrestling fans would definitely turn on him. I'm waiting for that day. Uh, that's facts. Uh, but it was cool to see them working together. Yeah, it definitely really was. Like, um, the whole... AEW and Impact Partnership was really good and stuff like that. I was really enjoying the uh, childish uh, promos uh, until I realized, yeah, it was all fucking bashing. Like you don't, you don't, you don't bury your competition in a way like that. Like you know, there's other ways to bury them, but not to do it like that. And you know what? Uh, as much as I love Tony Schiavone, and he was you know, one of the voices of, like, my childhood watching wrestling and stuff like that, like, he should know better, and he should be telling Tony Khan, like, yo, this, I don't think this is gonna work. This shouldn't, like, work like that. Um, uh, Switchblade also said, I personally wanted Keith Lee to be signed to, uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. He will benefit more there. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, Keith Lee would have to get with the program of, like, how to work as a new Japan wrestler, he may put in the work, he may do it, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't see, I mean, he can have like a match to see how like it works out. But if he was really going to be signing with like new Japan strong, um, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how that would go. I don't think, I don't think new Japan and him will be a good fit. Um, just because there's a lot of hard hitting action, um, a lot of strikes, a lot of kicks, and, you know, I just, I just don't know. The G1 Climax? I don't think he's ready for a G1 Climax. I don't think he can handle that schedule. But, um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, New Japan Cup starts, uh, March 2nd, and it's gonna have 48 competitors. So you never know. He might enter into the New Japan Cup, and if he can survive that tournament then I will be like, yes, he could survive the G1. Right now, I do not think that if we put Keith Lee in the G1, that he's not going to survive it. He That G1, like, takes a mental toll on people, and it's not for everyone. Um, point in case is, uh, I think Hangman, right? Hangman, uh, I think Hangman did a G1. Uh, let me, let me uh, look that up. And, you know, I don't mean to get on Hangman all the time in my, like, live streams or my podcast episodes. If you guys think that I am, I'm really not. It's just that there are there are guys who put in the work and guys who really want to make their character shine and get the fact that wrestling is entertainment no matter what. Yes, there is an, like, athleticism uh, to it. There's a lot of factors into it. But at the end of the day, it's core. It is entertainment. And like I always say, it is the most purest form of theatrical theater if that makes sense uh because i was like i'm using theatrical you know theater okay hope it makes sense um
Uh, did he go to the G1? Uh, yes, he did. He did go to the G1. Um, but yeah, I, you know, uh, not every person is, uh, made for, for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they announced it, uh, well, today, really, uh, that they are going to be having, uh, 48, um, competitors, uh, for, um, the New Japan Cup this year. Uh, so we're going to get that, pre we're going to get more details in the press conference, um, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say today. Um, let me, hold on. I think it's, all right. So yeah, so it will be today for Japan that we'll get the press conference. Um, but, uh, for us, obviously it'll be tomorrow. Uh, cause over there it is already February 21st. Um, it's already, uh, like eight in the morning. So yeah, we're going to get that press conference. Um, you know, the next time around. Um, I do not know. I mean, the only person that I know that's probably going to be in it is, uh, is Chase. Uh, anyone else? I don't know who else is going to be in it, but like, I know that Chase is like a definite, uh, like competitor in it. So yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, other than that, uh, let's see, um, run it back, <laughs> uh, hey, I mean, uh, Will Ospreay is probably going to be in it. Will Ospreay is definitely going to be in it. Um, I cannot confirm or deny that, but like the fan in me wants him in it. Um, you know, United Empire is definitely going to be in it. Uh, the Great Okan has definitely been um, wrestling back to back to back to back um, against people. Um, Jeff Cobb might even be in it. Hinari is going to probably be in it. If Hinari is not in it, I'm going to be upset. Um, and New Japan Wrestling <laughs> and New Japan will know. Um, yeah, Jay, Jay is not going to. Yeah, he's not going to be there. Uh, Jay is too busy, uh, dealing with the drama he fucking created, um, which I have some more theories on it. Cause I was having theories last night. Um, so let's see who else we can think of. We know that like Tai Chi and like Zack Sabre Jr. are going to be in it. Um, I don't think Yano or Suzuki are going to be in it cause they're too busy battling for the freaking, um, Kata Pro Wrestling Trophy, which is fucking stupid. But that's just me. I just think it's stupid. Uh, wait, he can't. He's supposed to be in... Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's supposed to be in Tampa. Yep, he's supposed to be in Tampa. But New Japan Cup doesn't start until March 2nd. And Japan just said that um, foreigners are allowed to go into the country now. So when they're flying over, they're allowed to enter the, con the country. But any new type of tourists are not allowed to go to Japan right now. Excuse me. Uh, so foreign. So anyone who uh wants to, any wrestler who wants to work over there in Japan are able to go to Japan March first. Um, but they might have to go early because of the COVID protocols, which uh they kind of lowered the the amount of stay you gotta do in the in the government uh hotels, which is basically if you have like all three shots. Um, you are only allowed to stay in the hotel room for like three days just to make sure that like when you're coming from wherever you are in the world to over there that, um, you know, you should be good. Uh, yes, Hinari definitely deserves the spotlight. This dude knows that I will advocate for him like no matter what. So he knows that I want him to have the spotlight and the KOPW is stupid. So, uh, you know what? Let's start talking about, you know, Jay White doing JY things. Um, and I had specifically told Tama that once I told Tama that JY does, does JY things. Um, what does that mean? It basically means that JY White is always going to be in it for himself. Uh, he's always going to go into business for himself. Um, there's never a time where like he was always, he was good with a team because every single thing that he ever did, he always backstabbed somebody. 
you know, he went to chaos for a little bit. He didn't like, um, you know, the treatment that he was getting in chaos. You know, um, this is, this is when he comes back from excursion, right? Uh, he comes back from excursion. He's, uh, known as Switchblade Jay White. He grew up from being a knife pervert, according to Trent. Uh, so... <laughs> Yo, like, I I just know that if I get to be on Tama's Island, it's going to be fucking awkward, okay? Like, I both love Jay and Tama. But if, if I have to pick a side, right? Sometimes they say it's better to trust the devil you know rather than the devil you don't know. As much as Jay gives off that bad boy freaking personality that will one day be the death of me just because that's like one of my preferences. Um, if you guys want to know that, uh, I would usually, I would usually side with someone like Jay White just because of that bad boy personality. And I would probably give into it, but, um, <laughs> I rather side with the devil I know. Um, the devil that has, you know, welcomed me with open arms. Uh, you know, the one that definitely is not an ass to me. And I'm not saying that Jay was ever an ass to me. Um, but like I've met, you know, some asshole guys in wrestling and shit like that. Uh, you know, but I know that if Tama ever needed like his Tama Island crew that will have his back. Uh, we'll be there like, you know, soldiers. And I've always said this to myself that like the way that Tama inspires people, even though like he talks a lot of shit, but the way that he does is because of all that passion and truth that he has, um, just like written on his sleeve. And when he talks, everyone listens. So, you know, I rather go with somebody that I know will have my back. Tama and Loa and Hikaleya would definitely have my back. Jay would, you know, in story, <laughs> Jay in, in, in story and kayfabe, because you guys got to remember, like, I love all this shit in kayfabe. Uh, so, you know, Jay, I would have to have eyes in the back of my head because I don't know when my help or my presence will expire because Jay tends to move on to the next thing. If he's not enjoying something, he moves on to the next thing. If he's not getting any type of fulfillment for what he's doing, he's going to go to the next thing to get that kind of fulfillment. And that's what makes him such a fantastic uh, champion. That's what's going to make him, you know, a fantastic storyteller. And I was thinking about this recently that, you know, he has said it in like other interviews that Randy Orton was like the, the guy that got him into wrestling and stuff. And... If you haven't noticed, Jay White is essentially like, you know, the Rand the Randy Orton of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, just because of how he is portrayed, uh, the way he thinks, he just does it on a very higher level than Randy Orton. So like Randy Orton is the blueprint and Jay White is like, oh, I could do it way better. And he does. And, um, you know, that's why it's kind of hard for me to like pick a side. And I even said that I don't want this to happen again because the last time we had a civil war, it was between Kenny and Cody. Now, granted, I don't really like Cody like that. So it was easy. I picked Kenny and the Young Bucks. But either way, I did not want to see like family implode. And I really do consider Bullet Club to be family because of their ideology is something that I uh, connect with as a fan because, you know, I am, first of all, I am a female who loves professional wrestling and growing up, I was basically like the black sheep of the family because, you know, no one else uh, liked professional wrestling like me. My dad got me into professional wrestling and it just stuck. So, you know, I'm here talking to you about professional wrestling and like breaking it down like no other and, you know, um, accomplish my dreams of going to WWE and was the only person in my family to be like, I'm doing this, this, and this accomplish all of that. Cause the rest of my family are like bums, not like literal bums, but like they didn't accomplish 
you know, what they wanted to do. Me, I'm the only one that accomplished what I wanted to do. Um, so Bullet Club just sort of has that like family that kind of brings together the outcasts, the ones that don't fit into society, the ones that, you know, have like a logical common sense thinking other than like following the fucking sheep out there and the echo chambers and would rather like do the research on their own, uh, come up with their own conclusions and making sure that like, you know, this is what it is. This is all the research I did. This is all facts. And, you know, not really rely too much on emotion, like how we're seeing it now. Um, so, you know, there's a reason why I gravitate towards, um, you know, Bullet Club. And it's because they're also like strong in like leadership, even though the whole entire Bullet Club has like fucking alpha males and they can't seem to get their shit together sometimes. But family does fight uh, and then family does reconcile and then family backstabs everybody. Um, it's the perfect hall hallmark uh, novella story in professional wrestling, if you ask me. Um, but yeah, that's why I feel so strongly about, you know, Bullet Club and not wanting Bullet Club to ever end or dissolve. Uh, even though, like, I'll still support the guys in Bullet Club, but it's still the idea of Bullet Club is fucking family. Um, and I remember, like, the first time, like... Tama welcomed me into like the Tama Island crew. That shit is like the best feeling ever. Cause there was like no judgment, no nothing. It was just like, hey, what's up, Marie? Even though he thought that I was a dude. Um good times, man. Good times. Um, that's why, like, if battle lines need to be drawn, right? And for people in the comments, if you guys like think I'm stupid or like going crazy or, you know, too much invested into this. It's okay. It's totally okay. I'm having so much fun with this, okay? Uh, I'm not angry at anybody for what happened in Bullet Club, but um, I'm just having way too much fun. You can tell by this cheesy-ass smile that this means everything to me. Like, wrestling in general means everything to me. But, yeah, if battle lines need to be drawn, I am most likely going to be siding with Tama and Loa and Hikaleo because... I think that, oh, and, and Haku, because uh, I think that uh, we are probably going to get the firing squad. Uh, I do think that something else is happening in Bullet Club, and Jay is probably going to get a new member on his side. Not really a new member, because he's still a member of Bullet Club. And if you paid close attention to uh, New Japan... Pro Wrestling, uh, New Japan Golden Final. And, uh, you know, El Fantasmo has been having such an inner character crisis uh, over the past couple of weeks, ever since being exposed. And when I say exposed, it's because uh, Robbie Ego and Taguchi finally managed to take off El Fantasmo's boot, right? So for the longest, El Fantasmo's running story and his uh, running gimmick, if I should say, um, he has a metal boot. He has a metal plate in his boot. He doesn't have a metal boot. He has a metal plate in his boot. Uh, and he would always super kick everybody. And then it's called the sudden death. And then that's it. One, two, three. Um, you know, uh, El Fantasma will get the victory. And so his story will be that, oh, in Canada, he would just always super kick maple trees in order to get like a really strong heel. Sure, could be believable from time to time. So, the day that they exposed the fact that there is a metal plate in his boot, um, you know, him and Taiji, uh, hey, Sleeping Collectibles, what's up? Thank you for joining me. Yes, uh, the plate in his boot was clever. I gotta give it to him. Clever. I gotta give him, gotta give him all the props. So, uh, when they found it, um... I think Marty, Marty, the official was there. Yeah, because it's Marty. Because Marty, like, man, that dude, that referee, man. Uh, so he e ejected El Fantasmo and Taiji out of that, uh, what was it, like that triple threat tag team match and stuff like that. So that's what happened. Fast forward to, like, you know, weeks. Uh, El Fantasmo has been doubting himself and the super kick. 
And that has made Taiji very frustrated, especially when their finisher is a combination, is a tag team move, and he can't do it. So Taiji has to, like, finish off the match, or they might lose, or something like that. So this time, uh, the news of, you know, Bullet Club breaking down at No Surrender and Jay White turning on Tama uh, hit Japan very fast. Uh, Japan wrote up their article, so basically, you know, it was already there. And, you know... Alfred Tasmo tells something to Kevin Kelly. I'm not sure if anyone picked this up. But, you know, Kevin is in shock. Everyone is in shock. Uh, Alfred Tasmo says to Kevin Kelly that, yeah, you should see backstage is, is chaotic. You know, I don't know what's going on. And Kevin is like, hey, can you give us an update? Like, what do you know? Like, you know, all, you know, like what a journalist would do, ask these questions. Um, Alfred Tasmo is all like... I don't know what happened, but, you know, Jay did text me, and then Kevin follows it up with, um, what did he text you? And, uh, El Fantasma did not want to say. And then he had his, uh, tag team match, and I'm like, El Fantasma knows something. So, if Tama wants to start looking for answers, you gotta go to El Fantasma and ask him what Jay has said. Um, it may not be nothing or it may be something, uh, for this whole entire story. And when I heard that, I was like, this story is going to be really, really good. And it's going to be like the best civil, civil war story in bullet club because the other one with Kenny and Cody, that was fucking stupid. Uh, that was fucking stupid. Um, but yeah. Uh, he did say that he talked to uh, Jay today, which is interesting. Which brings me to another uh, point. Um, and yeah, uh, to uh, Switchblade's uh, GT's point, uh, I also agree with him too that this is having me think that Jay is going to get to the Elite. Um, I have posed this on Twitter. If you guys are not following me on Twitter, at Marie underscore Shadows, you can follow me there. I talk to everyone and anyone about wrestling. I really don't care. Um, just don't be a douchebag. That's all. I had said and tweeted out that, um, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, what did I, what did I say about that? Oh yeah. Um, wait, did I say, I, I said something along the lines of like, maybe this is a way for uh, Switchblade to, oh yeah, for Switchblade to destroy the elite from the inside out. Um, and then like maybe uh, like come back to Bullet Club. But when you cross Tama, there is no coming back. Uh, it's either, you know, you decide to blood yourself in with Tama and the rest of them, or you just don't do it and you're like a hang around. Like, you really got to think about it in terms of how would you run the South Side? And by the way, I might get into, like, some GTA role-playing, like, analogies because I watch a lot of GTA role-playing as well. So, you know, you got to think of it like that. Like, it's a family and shit like that. Um, it's always been Fuck the Elite. Yeah. Um, it definitely has. Um... Yeah, there's definitely no coming back when you uh when you screw over Tama. The other thing too is that um I think based on the interviews that J White has been having over the past couple of days leading up to No Surrender, right? So hey Sleeping Collectibles, thank you for subscribing over on the YouTube side. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh Thank you for being here and sharing your opinion too. Um, but I really do think that um, the interviews that Jay White does are very telling. Uh, I personally think that you don't like, you know, if I ever interview Jay White on like the Square Circle podcast, just know it. I'm not sure if it's going to be done in one take, but let me not get ahead of myself. Um, I just know that uh, whenever he's, he does interviews, he sort of tells you what you want to hear versus what his character would say, even though like it's 
technically like him in a way, but what his character would say, what he would think the fans would take at his, at his word, because all of us here sort of like sit at the edge of our seats, listening to what he has to say, because he's one of the best to do it. So here's what I think. Um, I'm sorry. My nose is starting to get stuffy. This shit happens like all the fucking time. Um, so, uh, during one of the interviews, uh, he was saying how he wants to make Bullet Club in like a really huge family where he is uniting, uh, former Bullet Club members across the brands. So you have the elite over in, um, AEW who were part of Bullet Club. Uh, you have Bullet Club hanging out in Impact, New Japan Strong. Um, so he just wants to like unite everybody. And then he goes and says that, um, so Jay White never really had to deal with, uh, the things that Tama had to deal with the Young Bucks and Kenny and, uh, what Tama had to deal with the Good Brothers, right? So Jay never experienced any of that. And because Jay never experienced any of that, he doesn't see a reason why there should still be burned bridges. He feels that, you know, maybe, um, with all this time that maybe there should be like some forgiveness or whatever, but like the things that Tama experienced, Jay hasn't experienced it. So that's why he could be friendly and that's why he can, you know, work with, um, you know, the elite, uh, Adam Cole, uh, the good brothers, because he doesn't have that same, I'm looking for the fucking word for this. Um, I don't want to use the word animosity, but he doesn't have that same feeling that, Tama has towards these guys. Um, as you can see, uh, Jay, White, Jay White does things in a business sense where he's just working with you. If he has to work with you, that's all it is. It's a working relationship. It's not personal. There we go. I can say that. Uh, it's not personal with Jay. Uh, it's personal with Tama in regards to the elite. Probably Adam Cole. Probably. Um, and then like the Good Brothers. Uh, but it... but. All of that is not personal to Jay. So that's why Jay can do whatever he wants to do and make these business deals for himself because he doesn't see the reason that Tama would have want him to do it. It's one of those things of like, uh, Jay came in late to Bullet Club and um, he doesn't want to carry the baggage of the past mistakes of the others. So, um, you know, that's his mindset. So in every, I'm, I can't say every interview, but the, there was one particular interview where he just basically says that, you know, um, he has no issues with the Young Bucks and uh, Adam Cole. That's why he's working with them. However, when it came to talking about the Good Brothers, he really said that uh, the Good Brothers is specifically like Thomas Thane. Um, Tom was going to take care of it. Like Jay White wasn't going to like insert his nose into that. That's Thomas thing to take care of, to take care of that. Um, and then all of a sudden, as we saw no surrender, uh, you know, um, Chris Bay coming out, that was the first red flag of like, what is, what is Bay doing here? Why is Bay distracting the referee? And then like Loa getting choke slam and then that's it. And then Jay comes in and does that. And then just sits with this look on his face of like, it It almost looked like as if like Tama pushed him to do that. Like Tama brought him to that point in time to do this Blade Runner. Um, and then to be over the body of Tama and uh, Too Sweet Everybody. Um, which by the way, a lot of people on Twitter are like, Jay kicked out Tama. No. <laughs> Jay did not kick out Tama. Um, you know, uh, Switchblade GC says, before in a backstage comments, Jay said that this is real Bullet Club and this isn't cheap ripoff. Yeah, right? Like, I I don't know. I don't know if any of that stuff in the past, because I remember that because I podcasted about that, that exact same uh, comment that you uh, put here. Uh, GT, I don't know if any of that is getting factored into this whole story. That's why, like, I have more questions than answers. And, you know, Tama's a little upset and he's heated. So it's like, 
uh, you know, maybe should I send him like cat videos? Like, I don't know. Or dog videos. I don't know if he's a cat or dog person, but like, I don't know if any of that stuff from back in 2020, that any of that is going to get factor in. If not 2020, 2021. Uh, but yeah, I podcasted all about that. But my thinking is that, uh, oh yeah, first of all, Jay did not kick out Tama. G.O.D. is probably going to bring back Firing Squad and it's still going to be under the banner of Bullet Club. What the stipulation, stipulation, because it really wasn't a stipulation, was, was that um, the Good Brothers kept saying that if they beat G.O.D., that they kill Bullet Club. That does not mean that they're taking the mantle of Bullet Club. That means that they're um, like doing away with Tama and Loa and separating from them. And the Good Brothers will continue to be the Good Brothers. Um, the Elite will still be the Elite. And then JY will still probably carry Bullet Club. Like, I don't know what this... Um, uh, I don't know what this like really means. I don't know if he's still going to uphold Bullet Club and think that, you know, he is Bullet Club. He represents Bullet Club because of how his work ethic is or like how many people like he took out or like how many championships he won. Like, I don't know the criteria, but yeah, GT, there's, there's a lot of people I've been seeing on the timeline saying that Jay kicked out Tama and it's like, no, that's not how it happened. Jay just removed himself from being with Tama and Loa and the rest of them. Um, he just removed himself because he saw it. He either saw it early in the signs where this is probably not going to work out or he was getting too bored and nothing was really happening with the group as it is. Um, Tama and Loa are turning baby face as we saw during the G1. Uh, they weren't doing Bullet Club tactics. Uh, what makes Bullet Club great is that they do Bullet Club tactics, even though they cheat a lot and we're like, stop the cheating. But... In order to be Bullet Club, in order to uh, defend um, Bullet Club and stuff like that, like, you know, they do Bullet Club tactics, which I talked about, you know, what that really means. Um, but yeah, people really think that Jay kicked out Tama by doing the Blade Runner. No, Jay just double-crossed Tama um, and got himself out of Bullet Club before Tama was like, hey... I know you've been doing a good job, you know, doing this, being the forerunner and shit like that, you know, but it's time for you to go. So instead of that, he, he left on his own. However, I do believe that the Good Brothers whispered into Jay's ear somehow and promised him something that, like, Tama probably could not promise him, right? Maybe that could be, like, a better position, Maybe at AEW because, you know, after this, like, the Good Brothers are going to go to AEW and have, like, a little, excuse me, a little skit or something like that. Like, you know, the Good Brothers are going back there. Jay is going to show up there or, like, you know, the Good Brothers are going to go to Japan. When I say Japan, I mean, like, New Japan Strong um, or something like that. But I think that something happened where the Good Brothers offered Jay something that Tama probably could not promise him. Um, and Jay being an, um, an opportunist that he is went and basically like decided to go that route and why not take Chris Bay? Cause Chris Bay has been hungry and Chris Bay has been waiting for opportunities. And sometimes if you wait, opportunities pass you by. Sure. You know, for someone like me and for someone like GT will probably say like, you know, Maybe that wasn't the best option because now he's hanging around the wrong crowd. But as a wrestler, you got to do what's best for you. The same way as a human being, you got to do what's best for you. If you know that this is going to alienate a lot of people, go and fucking do it because it's your life and you live that one life. Um, you don't get a second chance sometimes. And if this can be his big break, then why not? I am all for, uh, you know, Chris Bay doing what Chris Bay does. Oh, wait, did I just, I just coined something else. Chris Bay does, Chris Bay does Chris Bay things. 
I think you gotta have like a cool ass name in order to like have that. Let's see. Tamatanga does Tamatanga things. No, that just sounds like I'm chanting. Like, you know, I'm trying to summon Tama. Tamatanga does Tamatanga things. No. <laughs> but I totally created Chris Bay does Chris Bay things. Oh my God. Oh, this is gonna be great. Um JY does JY does JY things. Chris Bay does Chris Bay things. I think that that was a perfect pick for Bullet Club now, like 100%. Like, I was always on board for Chris Bay coming through and being part of Bullet Club or whatever it is, and now he's under um, Jay White's uh, wing. So, like, yeah, that's, like, super that's super cool. I'm proud that I made up that, that thing of Chris Bay does Chris Bay things. So now, if Chris Bay does Chris Bay things, I'm going to probably fucking say it. Which is going to be different for him because if you guys were here a little bit before, I was saying that uh, Jay White does Jay White things, meaning that he goes into business for himself sometimes. That Jay White is all about himself and protecting like his image, his identity, um, and doing the things that he wants to do uh, when he wants to do it. And um, if he doesn't find fulfillment in one, he goes on to the next and does that. Um, and you know he picks the right times. For when he does it. This one was a complete slow burn of it. Of turning on Tama and getting out while he can. Because that's what he did. He got out uh, while he can. Um, so yeah, this is going to be great. Chris Bay does Chris Bay things. Ah, awesome. Yeah, I know. I, I know it took you a while to accept him into Bullet Club. Um, but... You know, Chris Bay is the ultimate finesser. So, you know, it works out. It really works out. I'm proud of myself, guys. I really am. Oh, well, yeah. Those are my theories. Um, I also think that once we get down to the bottom of whatever El Phantasmo and um, Jay White talked about, uh, El Phantasmo is, uh, gonna be probably breaking up with Taiji and then, like, going over to the States and, like, being with Jay White and, like, the rest of the elite. Um, Chris in, in the elite, they're gonna have the most childish, um, BTE segments ever. And I'm just like, I don't know if I'm there for it because I stopped watching BTE because it was so, um, you know, uh, childish that I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Um... I just don't like it uh, whenever the elite is, like, uh, trying to, like, throw the negative stuff back into the fans' faces as if, like, um, you know, we weren't the ones that helped them get to this fucking point. Um, I totally get it that people leave uh, negative comments and, you know, just go at them in a really stupid way. But, um, you know, you don't have to remind us every single time. And speaking of the Young Bucks, right? Uh, they decided to put up a new bio where it says that um, they never really liked Tama, to be honest. And um, I don't know. Hold on. Let me uh, let, let, let me go grab that picture so that we could be here in, in the video uh, for it. this oh oops uh hey israel what's up um bt just changed it's like two minutes of the bucks and 20 minutes of the the dark order and other people and bc says they just ask you to get the firing squad again they are it's like they don't um like learn like you know, I'm all for, uh, you know, I'm all for like rehashing or bringing up, actually, no, I'm not rehashing stuff. I'm all for bringing up, uh, loose ends that never got tied, but shit, it's like, you guys don't fucking learn. Um, young bucks must have, yeah, they must have not learned back in San Francisco. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Um, but okay. Uh, for Israel, uh, thank you for letting me know that the, uh, you know, um, BTE has changed, but I'm not, that, that's not going to make me watch. 
And yes, the return of King Haku. Like, I remember somebody on Twitter, I don't remember who it was, but they said that, um, you know, um, Haku can definitely, like, destroy all of them. Um, you know. So here is the tweet. I hope you guys can, like, see it. Um, this here is, like, you know, I really want to kick the young bucks. I really do. Um, I have grown so tired of them because they basically rehashed everything from the 2000s when they were at the height and peak of their career in Ring of Honor and just up their thing, like, multiple. Uh, up their annoyance uh, by, like, tenfold. And I really just can't stand it. And it's like... You know, I would have loved if they would have started off their brand new career at AEW as technical wrestlers. Because for anyone that has ever listened to my podcast uh, show, or if you're new, welcome if you're new. I'm Marie Shadows again, host and creator of the Square Circle Podcast. I always say that I love the, the technical side more than I love the flips. However, if you can sort of combine both of them together, that would be great. But I'm more technical than anything. Yes, I remember them as Generation Me Too back in TNA, um, and I remember seeing them come out of Ring of Honor at one point as Generation Me. So, yes, um, I followed their career. I, I know what they're about, um, but half the time it's just like, you know, you guys could have came up with something different. You guys could have put on a different spin, uh, so that way you, as the Young Bucks, can evolve rather than keep doing the same spot at the same spot at the same spot at the same spot. And then you wonder why, like, you might have to take off time in such an early career of um, everything. Uh, but yeah, this tweet here, uh, <laughs> GT says, uh, can't lie, I still love the Young Bucks. I love them too, but like, shit, do you guys have to be super annoying? Do they? Don't get it. Oh, yeah. And by the way, for anyone that's not following me on Twitter, go ahead and do that. At Marie underscore Shadows, just because uh, I put up a question up there and like nobody has answered it because that's what the AEW faithful does. They don't like to answer questions for someone who questions them uh, like me. Uh, I basically said, can you tell me an AEW storyline? Um, Because I could not tell the fans earlier in this podcast episode, um, you know, what storyline that they're fucking doing. So if anyone out there wants to drop in chat about, uh, you know, what storyline they can tell me about in AEW, that would be great. Uh, just because, um, anyway, while I continue to talk about more stuff, right? Cause I already gave you all of my ideas. Oh yeah. Uh, more stuff from, from Tama, um, because Tama was on a rampage, um, like last night and like this morning. Uh, so even Rocky is getting into it and I'm here like, Rocky, you should know better. Like you should know not to antagonize Tama. Um, Rocky thinks that, you know, it's the right thing to do because Bullet Club has been such a thorn in his side. Uh, let me take off this, um, I guess the elite versus, yeah, I mean, but like currently, current stories in AEW that I can go in depth and like break it down the same way that I'm, I'm here talking about, you know, the whole Jay White situation and trying to be like, oh, maybe it could have been this. It could have been that, um, the elite versus the inner circle. Cool. I get that. That's great. Um, you know, back in the day when I was watching, I mean, I, I watch AEW from time to time, but it's like on Twitter and stuff. Uh, but, you know, uh, when we were doing the story of Hangman and Kenny, um, that I was able to break down for you guys. And I have um, a YouTube video and a podcast episode, me breaking it down, going in depth into the history of Hangman Adam Page. And the history of uh, Kenny Omega and like why it was the way that it was. Um, so I was able to do it. I just can't. Um, I just can't do it currently. Oh, 
GT says he hasn't been keeping up with them lately. And um, yeah, that's what I mean. Like we had story in the beginning. Now we have micro stories. That's what I was saying. We have micro stories in AEW and you can't rely on micro stories alone because um, because of that. Um, just so you guys know, John Moxley is a hit or miss for me when it comes to his storytelling ability and his uh, wrestling ability. Like, there's only like a, a not even a handful of matches where I could be like, oh, okay, that was good. I can explain it. Uh, but yeah, John Moxley is just like a hit or miss for me. Um, you know, that that's all it is. Um, all right, so I'm gonna take out this Young Bucks thing. Um, just because I really don't want it there. Oh yeah, and by the way, if uh oh I'm gonna get to New Japan Strong eventually in this podcast thing, but like the Jay White and Bullet Club thing is just so much um, you know, for me to break down for you guys because I love this shit. Like I really do. And if you enjoy uh hearing me talk, the easiest way to support me, um, I know a lot of people throw out their um like a PayPal to directly support me and stuff like that. Um, you know, I would too, but uh there's an easier way. There is a website called uh coffee, which you guys could probably think of it as like, you know, buy me a coffee. Or if I didn't want to use the word coffee, you can uh, buy me a hug. That's what I have it. Um, I think that hugs are a little bit more um, encouraging and better. So think of this page like, um, you know, a Patreon, except that coffee is a lot more creative for my creative mind. So for everyone that's here, if uh, you enjoy what um, I've been saying for the past uh, hour and like 37 minutes about professional wrestling and you understand my passion for it, uh, click that link. Um, and all you have to do, if you want to give a one-time donation of like $3, which would be a $3 hug for me. And then if you want to get my wrestling bingo cards that I made, head over to the shop, get wrestling bingo cards. And if you need me to do any type of work that you want me to do, like writing or editing something that you wrote, um, go and do that. Um, I'm only plugging it in now because we do have a good amount of people and like I love everyone that's here. I love everyone that's interacting with me and you know, I wouldn't be able to do this without you guys. Um, so yeah, and then yeah, so if you guys want to help me out that way, you can and you are supporting me directly. Uh, the coffee website does not take a fee. Um, you could just do a one time donation if you think that my analytic skills for professional wrestling is really deserving of you giving me a hug. That's all. Um, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, so GT is totally right. Um, with, uh, uh, that AEW needs more long-term storytelling. Uh, they really do something, something that catches people, you know, um, again, I have a writing degree, you know, AEW could always hit me up, but they're not going to do that. Um, like I said, I eventually get to New Japan strong and shit like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, GT says Moxley is soft right now. Ever since his steam has changed, he kind of fell off. Uh, I guess I have no comment on John Moxley, but yeah, it's the idea of micro stories and shit like that. Um, I think I covered everything for JY. Oh no, more. I, okay. Uh, so yeah, talking about Rocky, um, Rocky decided to come at Tama being like four, 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 life, right? That, that fucking shit. Um, <laughs> and it's like, bro, I know that you're just messing around and shit like that, but, um, when you're actually part of something that somebody knows your name, it hits different than like being in chaos and nobody knowing like your name. So, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know why Rocky wants to poke the bear that is Tama Tonga. Um, and then, you know, uh, Tama telling Jay that he's a dead man, which I thought was pretty funny. I was just like, Oh man, here we go. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, Tama telling the Young Bucks is cause sometimes, you know, everybody wants to know your name. Mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. Right? 
Ravage had to make an appearance. That was Ravage Dragon. If you guys want, you can go follow him too. Um, because we do Ravage Lands together, uh, which is basically a gaming um family thing. Me and him. Um well, I really can't say family. Well, it used to be like a family thing. Um yeah, Ravage is my boo. He wanted to come and make a fucking cameo when he knows that he probably shouldn't. But, yeah. Uh, I would get his fucking Twitch account up here so I could just put it there so that way he could be like, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he's also streaming too, by the way. Uh... <laughs> Give me a second. We should technically... Hold, hold on, this hold is going to work. Uh, not to take people away from me talking about wrestling, but because he decided to fucking make an appearance, let me just be the good girlfriend and like put his stuff out there. Okay? Uh, me and him talk about wrestling 24-7. Um, and you know, uh, I don't know if I ever want him to be on the show, but he just decided to make a fucking cameo appearance. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to go follow him and, um, basically say what's up, uh, you know, you guys could go do that shit too. Um, maybe we'll, we'll raid him. Uh, but yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Tama telling the Young Bucks to basically suck his dick, uh, after putting that comment of, um, they never liked Tama to be honest. And it's like, what is there not to like about Tama? Is it because like, he's a good guy? Um, yeah, he's playing South Park. Um, we play, I, well, sometimes we but he plays a lot of variety games. Um, he doesn't really stick to like one, but um, yeah, he's playing South Park right now. Uh, for anyone that's listening to this on audio, uh, Ravage Dragon decided to do a cameo and um, you know, uh, I put his tw Twitch channel in the chat. So, you know, don't worry and don't be like, who the fuck am I talking about? But yeah, um, but yeah, Tyler keeps it real. And that's what I like about Tama, I'd rather have Tama talk to me with 100% honesty, uh, even if I don't want to hear it, because, you know, us as humans be as human beings, I can't talk right now because I've been doing this for like an hour and 43 minutes, uh, live stream, um, you know, I'd rather have Tama keep things 100% with me than lie to me or twist the truth a little bit, but I will give leeway to if someone has to twist the truth with me just to protect me, there will be a leeway. But if it's just a straight up lie, then yeah, we got problems. But if you're going to be completely 100% honest with me, then I'd rather have that than like nothing at all. Um, but yeah, Tama definitely keeps it 100% real. And sometimes people just don't like that. Um, and, or sometimes people just don't want to see it. Uh, his way if it makes sense um, and stuff. Uh, other than that, like, Tama can if he needs to uh, you know, um, be like an alpha male uh, to take charge and control and stuff. But there's a lot of, like, telling in this whole entire Bullet Club drama um, that we're seeing. And we're gonna see more of it. Um... Tama didn't really uh, tweet much today, or I think he did. Um, I just know that when you guys tune in um, for Thomas Island on Tuesday at 6.30 over on his Twitch. Um, oh, yeah, he did tweet out the can't trust nobody type of thing, which is true. Um, and that's, that's something big in, like, Tongan and, like, um, like Polynesian culture and like in other cultures too and stuff like that. Um, the trust, the trusting thing is very big. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, 
when you guys tune in to uh, Thomas Island this Tuesday, um, you know, expect Thomas to be like really upset. Uh, I need answers. We all need answers. Um, and yes, I'm going to end the Bullet Club talk here with, uh, is Bullet Club really fine? We don't know. I don't know what's happening. Um, I don't really, I don't really know. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, another topic. See, even Switchblade GT in the chat is saying, I need some damn answers. I need answers too, you know? Um, GT and I are like the closest to the source. Uh, but again, I want to put this, this this disclaimer out there just in case if like any wrestlers come by and they like just, you know, want to watch one of my streams. I never claim to be a wrestling dirt sheet writer. I never claim to be a journalist per se, the way that you see how the wrestling media is portrayed as being so cutthroat and um, just gatekeeping. If I am your friend and you know that uh, I have a podcast, um, I will never put your information out there as in like, you know, uh, if you give me a scoop, let's say, right? If you give me a scoop, I will not put it out there as like, oh my God, I got a scoop, guys. Like, you know, come watch my show, you know, give me donations, give me this, or I won't tell you or whatever, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not for that. I'm all for kayfabe and I'm all for, um, I'm all for kayfabe and I am all for, uh, you know, trying to figure this out like a detective. Um, I am no way, shape or form trying to be like damaging any type of story because I have a scoop and I put it out there and like, I'm not, I'm not about that. Um, I am more about, you know, uh, telling the story as it is, um, and just going with it and not necessarily like, um, you know, wanting to spoil it for people because to be honest, I did not really see this swerve coming. I did not see the fact that Jay was going to side with the Good Brothers to take himself out of the Bullet Club. Um, I didn't see that coming. Uh, Jay looked like he was on the path of, you know, going through the motions, doing all this work, and, you know, that was it. And, um, yeah, so if any wrestler out there that's like friends with me, um, know that I have a podcast and know that like I go on other people's podcasts and that I write about professional wrestling. If I am given a scoop, unless I am given permission to say something about that scoop, that's the only time that I will drop that scoop. I have integrity and I have passion for this business and I do not need to step over um, anyone else who just does it willy nilly just because I want the attention and I want the donations and I want everything else. Sure. I want all of that. I want all that love from you guys, you know, but I'm not going to be part of the copy and paste machine that's on Twitter and you guys give, you know, five bucks for copy and paste when, you know, we could be enjoying the story. We could be enjoying the breakdowns. We could be enjoying the speculation of like, oh, this and that. And somebody in that group talk could have a really good idea. And you're like, oh shit, I didn't think about that. Thanks for reminding me. And that makes sense as to why this person wanted to go do it. So there's a reason why someone like me who makes original content, whenever I say on Twitter that, you know, it's sad that sometimes Ordinary casual fans won't support an original content creator because they don't copy and paste wrestling news and rumors and be like, hey, I got this from so-and-so, you know, still pay me behind a paywall because I got it from so-and-so. That's like back in the day uh, in high school where somebody wanted to copy off of your homework and you let them do it. And they don't necessarily change anything about it. They might change something about it, but they're not really going to change anything about it. And then charge you for that person's uh, homework that they just copied and pasted. You know, I'm very 
passionate about the way that I present my ideas. I'm very passionate about the way that I break down professional wrestling like no other. Um, that's why, like, you know, I have a small circle and I am grateful for everyone and anyone that has ever had me on their show. Everyone and anyone that has, like, ever uh, interacted with me. And I will always be that um, that sweetheart until, like, you know, you push me or you break one of my boundaries uh, and stuff like that. And, you know, you will know when you fuck up if, like, you become friends with me. You will know. Um, it's the same way of, like, you know, being friends with Tama or just, you know, seeing how Tama works as a human being. Tama's cool up to a certain point. The moment that you decide to cross that line is the moment that you fucked up. And JY fucked up. So, yeah. That is my whole stance on um, when it comes to wrestling journalism, wrestling media, and, you know, for wrestlers, um, if they ever want to, like, you know, collaborate with me and stuff like that, their scoops are not going to be on, you know, uh, the first thing on my podcast because I don't really do that. You guys are human first. You guys are people first. And if it needs to be where um, I'm an asset to the storyline, fuck yeah, I'll do that shit. I was doing, I was already being assets to storylines on the indies. Even though it would have been cool, but, you know, again, I'm thought of as a fucking fan because I have this. No, my accolades, like, speak for themselves. Um, I went to WWE. Um, nobody can definitely, like, you know, take that from me. Um, uh, basically, after that, I did the indies. I helped out with Evolve for, like, their last show before WWE took them um, away from us. Uh, you know, I help out at other indie promotions when I could have. Uh, so I have like knowledge and backstage knowledge and I'm always there and I'm always available to do what I love to do. Uh, but yeah, but this isn't really a conversation about me, but I get passionate about it and I don't ever want wrestlers to group me into the wrestling media and how cutthroat and bad they like treat each other. Even though like they all... They all, when, like, when they get together, you could definitely see that they have to be fake with each other. You're going to get 100% me. You're going to get 100% real Marie Shadows where there is no gimmicks. Um, you come here to be yourself. I, I project to be myself, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, that's what, that's what I do. Um, other than that, we may have to, like, take a break. Because it's kind of unfair that I've been sitting here for a while. You guys have been sitting here for a while. Hearing me talk. Um, so. Uh, Switch, uh, Switchblade GT. If you want to know. Uh, Super Jcast. Like you know. Are one of the people that I keep seeing. That they say that. JY kicked out GOD from Bullet Club. And it's not. I don't even think that's right. Like that's not how it happened. Um, I know for damn sure when you guys tune into Thomas Island on Tuesday, that's probably the first thing that Thomas is going to say that, like, Jay did not kick us out. Um, you know, you can't kick out somebody that created the club. Like, I don't know. Um, but let's take a little mini break. We'll come back. We'll talk about uh, New Japan Golden, New Japan Strong, more No Surrender, minus the Bullet Club drama if I cannot re reference it. AEW is already taken care of and maybe some like elimination chamber. And then like, if you guys have questions, drop your questions below, but I, I really need a, um, a, uh, a break. So make sure to, uh, you know, go get water. Um, make sure to go get water, take a stretch, do something. Uh, I'll be back in a little bit. Um, enjoy these, uh, music. We gon' burn it down. Burn it down. We gon' burn it down. Burn it down. I killed it. It's murder. 